Hello, lovely internet strangers. I would like to point out that I am wearing a red top and not a black top in this video, and I hope that doesn't freak anyone out. It's a 1984 shirt. War is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. So I recorded a bunch of footage this weekend responding to Jordan Peterson and Brett Weinstein's views on polyamory, but after talking to my boyfriend a little more this weekend, I realized that I needed to think a little more carefully about what I wanted to communicate. I'll likely use some of that footage for related videos on relationships, marriage, and sex responding to Jordan and Brett's views, but I'd like to make this particular video more focused. So I'm prepared for the criticism I'll receive if anyone actually watches this video because number one, I'm well aware of the way Jordan and Brett's fans defend them from criticism or even disagreement. And number two, I'm well aware of the negative perception of polyamory from all across the ideological spectrum. I've been listening to Jordan Peterson since early 2017 and used to be a big fan of his. I still respect him, but I'm no longer a fangirl, but that's a topic for another video. I thought what happened to Brett Weinstein at Evergreen was awful, but I've never been a big fan of him as an intellectual. When he sticks to evolutionary biology, I find it interesting enough, but I'm more a fan of his wife, Heather Hying, and his brother, Eric Weinstein. I've heard both Jordan and Brett at various times speak about polyamory when speaking more broadly about their problems with non-monogamy and their defenses of monogamy and marriage. And I've been frustrated at their conflation of the term polyamory with the terms polygyny and promiscuity. And now I have a YouTube channel where I can share that frustration. I only found one video of a polyamorous person responding to their views, so there hasn't been much response from the poly community, though I'd argue using the word community to describe polyamorous people is a bit of a stretch. Jordan and Brett talk about how polyamory is bad both for the individual and society, but as they appear to mean polygyny or promiscuity, when they say polyamory, it's difficult to clearly address that argument. What I'll try to do here is explain what polyamory and open relationships are, why I think they provide most of the benefits that Jordan and Brett ascribe to monogamy, why I don't think polyamory is an enlightened way of being, and address their concerns about the children. The first time I encountered Peterson's views on polyamory was when I watched a clip from his August 2017 Patreon Q&A where he was asked, What is my opinion on open relationships, polyamory, other forms of non-monogamy? That's a poorly phrased question, and because of the format, he can't ask for definitions. And given all that I've heard him say on the topic, I'm not actually sure that he knows the definitions. So let's lay down some definitions. The easiest one is non-monogamy. Non-monogamy is a blanket term for any sexual and or romantic relationship that is not exclusive. This includes unethical and ethical non-monogamy. Unethical non-monogamy is cheating, whether it happens in the context of an explicitly monogamous relationship or an explicitly non-monogamous relationship. Yes, people who say they're polyamorous or in an open relationship can still cheat if they break their agreements with their partner or partners. Ethical non-monogamy indicates relationships where everyone is aware of their sexual and romantic partner's other involvements, the nature of those involvements, and has a say in negotiating the nature of those involvements. This includes open relationships and polyamory, along with BDSM and swingers and much more. Open relationships and polyamory have some overlap and can be used interchangeably by some, like yours truly. Open relationship generally denotes a pair-bonded relationship, whether the couple is married or not, where that relationship is primary, that is, is they are primary partners. Each member of the couple generally engages in individual sexual and romantic relationships with others on their own, although sometimes they date together. And although the parameters can vary given the centrality of the primary relationship, these couples, contrary to the connotation of the word open, often have many rules in place. Polyamory means multiple loves, and if someone says they're practicing polyamory, they are focused on having multiple loving relationships, which may include sex, but seeking a lot of sexual variety is generally not the goal, though it can be a byproduct. The stereotypical image of polyamory is three people living together under one roof, often raising kids, but as far as I'm aware, that's actually the minority among people who are practicing polyamory. You can have a loving relationship without living together or raising kids. Although my relationship structure is best described as an open relationship, I generally say I'm polyamorous because number one, open relationship makes it sound like it's a free-for-all when that's far from the truth. Two, I generally choose to get involved only with people I'd want to keep around as friends even if our sexual relationship ends. And three, we operate more under a mode of shared expectations and best practices than rules. So when answering this question in his Q&A, Jordan says, Well, I, I think that as a medium to long-term strategy, they're completely... Um untenable because human beings, as far as I'm concerned, are fundamentally pair bonding. I would agree with him that human beings are fundamentally pair bonding. Technically speaking, human beings have multiple pair bonds in their lives. Social pair bonds exist between you and your closest family members and friends. But I will grant him that most people want that special romantic relationship that is privileged over all others. And although it's a debate in the polyamorous community between those who believe in hierarchical and non-hierarchical relationship modes, I believe that overall, among the people practicing ethical non-monogamy, the hierarchical is more 
more common and I don't see that changing anytime soon. He was asked again about this topic in a more recent Patreon Q&A. Please give your perspective on why polyamory is bad for the individual in society. He says, let's say a man has many women and let's say he's a desirable man for that matter, just for the sake of argument. If he has a variety of women, then those women don't have much of him. So they don't get to establish a real individual relationship with him because it's going to be fragmentary. And I don't believe that that's satisfying for people. I think that what you want as much as you possibly can is to have people around you with whom you can weave your life together over the short term, medium term and long term. It adds depth to your life in a way that almost nothing else can. Number one, polyamory involves men and women having multiple partners, not just the men. Two, polyamory involves establishing deep relationships and not casual fragmentary ones. Three, people practicing polyamory generally advise against having more than two to three partners max, partners meaning life partners or the equivalent. People have a much higher capacity for lovers that you're not investing resources in. Four, people practicing polyamory do have people around them that they've weaved their lives together with in the short term, medium term, and long term. Now, Brett Weinstein says about polyamory, it prioritizes not locking yourself into a single sexual relationship. And I think there's a way in which there is a terror that surrounds locking yourself into a single sexual relationship. And part of the terror goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning of the conversation. If you think that um, beauty max is maxed out at 20 and then it wanes over life, then as a woman, you're trapped in this terrible situation where you've got this power long before you know what to do with it and it's going to evaporate so you better capitalize on it and if you're a man you're very frightened that you're going to get into a relationship and then you're going to watch this person that you love fall apart in front of your eyes and you're going to be you know you're going to be caught in that situation and i don't think this is the reality of a pair bond. I think the reality of a pair bond is way better than we fear. But that because we've got this overly simplistic mythology surrounding it, a lot of people are trying to solve that problem. How do I not get locked into that relationship that's going to trap me with somebody who's How do I not get bored? decaying in front of me? This is not what polyamorists are up to, as Brett put it. I don't think Jordan or Brett really understand how many people are practicing polyamory in open relationships. Healthy polyamorous relationships provide many of the same benefits of healthy monogamous relationships, and what polyamorous people are up to is very close to what Brett and Jordan advocate for, simply without the exclusivity. Many polyamorous people are even in closed polyamorous relationships or polyfidelitous relationships. That is, if a man has two partners, for example, and they're all happy with that, they may choose to not seek out any additional partners, and his relationships with those two people function much like monogamous ones. That is, there's not the constant possibility of new partners entering the scene. Also, just to clarify, even if three people are all involved, that is, a man is dating two bisexual women who are also dating, there is no such thing as a group relationship. There are three separate relationships that are closely linked. Three separate pair bonds. A problem here is that Jordan and Brett talk extensively about why polyamory won't work and talk only about marriage in its idealized form without discussing all the ways monogamy and marriage can and do break down. Polyamory can certainly fail, and when it fails, there can be more complicated fallout, certainly, but monogamous relationships and marriages fail all the time as well. When it comes to concerns about the children, it's not that I don't think it's a valid concern, but number one, many people who are polyamorous choose to be childless, and two, people who choose to have children while practicing polyamory have already thought this through and there's a ton of content about it in digital and print form. There aren't many studies on outcomes for children raised by polyamorous parents, so I doubt Jordan and Brett have based their positions on polyamorous parenting on any actual data, merely conjecture. It's hard to conduct such a study. Besides the difficulty of following the children over the course of their life, there are a small number of such children and it's difficult to identify them because of the stigma against such families. And because of responder bias, that is, the people most likely to respond are the functional ones with nothing to hide, no one's going, yes, I'm poly and I abuse my kids, here I I am. However, I was able to find one study for those who are curious, and I'll put that in the description box below. There have been interviews of people who've grown up in poly families about the pros and cons. I will link a couple of those below as well. I would likely agree with Jordan and Brett that promiscuity and polygyny would likely have poor outcomes for children, as having two parents has been shown to be the best model. However, generally this is compared against a single parent, or children being shuffled back and forth between divorced parents, or being raised by a biological parent and a step parent. And I would argue all those situations are not ideal compared to the two biological parents raising the child. 
However, in polyamorous situations, you generally see either two biological parents raising their biological child with a third person living in the house long term, essentially they are married without being legally married, or two biological parents raising their biological child and one or both of them who have long-term partners that live outside the home and may be known to the children as close family friends. Generally, what you find from the interviews of children who grow up poly is the worst part is the social stigma and that they actually benefit from having more adults around. Thomas Sowell has said in interviews that he's benefited from being raised by multiple adults. Camille Paglia also talks extensively about how the nuclear family is a modern phenomenon and that historically children grew up around multiple generations of adults. And when it comes to the question of men are concerned about paternity, people handle this in a variety of ways, but there's a fairly simple practical solution. The woman stops having sex with any other partners and then the couple that's going to have kids try to get pregnant. And if you think that's too much to ask because what if she doesn't hold up her end of the bargain, then you don't really have the basis of trust necessary to succeed in a poly relationship. And some women in monogamous relationships cheat and stick their partner with raising another man's kid unbeknownst to him. So being in a monogamous relationship doesn't guarantee 100% certainty of paternity. So then usually the man will stop having sex with other partners in solidarity. And once she is pregnant, then outside sexual relationships can resume. Although many wait until after pregnancy since the woman will be feeling a bit more needy due to hormones. And many have to dial back time with their other partners generally when they have a newborn because of a lack of time. Polyamorous people fully acknowledge that love is abundant, but time is not. But poly partners aren't just random fuck buddies who will get bored and move on if you have to stop having sex for a while. The boundaries in successful poly relationships are renegotiated according to changing circumstances. Both Jordan and Brett talk about the effects of polyamory on society, which they see as negative. I won't address here whether a wide-scale experiment in polyamory, as Brett referred to on Joe Rogan's podcast, would eventually become a polygynous society, as I don't feel knowledgeable enough to fully account for the game theory aspects. What I will address is that almost no one who is polyamorous is pushing for such an experiment. It's usually brought up by people who are opposed to polyamory. Most polyamorous people would just like to continue to break down the social stigma against their relationships, much like the LGBT community has done. Despite this breakdown of social stigma, most people are not LGBT. A small minority of polyamorous people advocate for the right to marry multiple people at the same time. And that isn't so radical when you consider that we already allow one person to have multiple marriages as long as they are sequential. Yes, this is penalized by the legal system, but given that those penalties are already in place, I see no reason to think they wouldn't apply to marrying multiple people at once. So I can't see many men signing up to marry multiple women beyond the polyamorous men who are already advocating for it, when we're already seeing many men refusing to marry even one woman, given the nature of the legal system's bias against men. And even if Jordan and Brett are discussing polygyny not to refer to legal marriage, but simply to one man having multiple simultaneous relationships with women, men still legally owe women child support whether they are married or not. It's possible men would attempt to evade their parental obligations, but the only things that make this possible are number one, the welfare state, number two, the birth control pill, and number three, women's equality in the workplace. The only way women would sign up to be one of many to a man would be either because she knew she would have enough money to support any children, whether through welfare or her own career, or she didn't want to have kids and could ensure that outcome through the birth control pill. Or the polyamorous option, she doesn't mind sharing that man with other women because she has her own primary life partner that provides her with financial, not to mention emotional, security. There could be no such thing as enforced polyamory the way there is enforced monogamy, as the people who practice polyamory generally have no problem with other people being monogamous. Regardless, to reiterate, the overwhelming majority of polyamorous people are not advocating for a wide-scale experiment in polyamory. In fact, many polyamorous people would advocate against it as a relationship model for most people, as it is difficult to pull off without certain foundational beliefs and communication skills. If the norms of the polyamorous community were adopted, I actually doubt that we'd even see a wide-scale experiment in polyamory. We'd more likely see healthier relationships, as all the polyamorous thought leaders, so to speak, promote healthy relationships. I'll link a couple of representative articles down below. The poly norms would include radical beliefs like, my partner is with me because I add value to his or her life. Given a choice, my partner would still choose to be with me. It is not necessary for my partner and me to be absolutely everything to one another. And relationships and friends come in many forms. Sexual compatibility or even love doesn't necessarily mean that we are compatible relationship partners. Radical stuff. The Poly Weekly podcast has many monogamous listeners because the podcast often discusses topics that apply to all relationships, such as how to negotiate with your partner, how to coordinate schedules, how to ask for what you want, how to be responsible for your own emotions, etc. And even the average polyamorous person works really hard at having very healthy relationships and improving their own emotional stability and emotional intelligence. Most people with a polyamorous worldview operate from the following premise. I am worth and deserve to be treated with a certain basic minimum of respect and love. It is better to have no relationship at all than a relationship in which
which these things are not true. Although many polyamorous people get married, they don't believe that marriage is any guarantee of security. They're somewhat Buddhist in that respect, as Buddhists talk about the inherent unreliability of experience. That is, the world is not under your control and looking for external sources of security will never bring you contentment. So I will acknowledge that we might see less people entering into state-sanctioned marriages, but generally I think if Jordan or Brett had a discussion with a poly educator, they would find many points of agreement and would approve of the way the poly community engages in an ongoing discussion about how to have healthy relationships. I want to clearly state that I don't believe that polyamory is a more enlightened way of conducting relationships, merely an alternative one. Brett isn't entirely off base. There are some people who have a kind of holier-than-thou attitude about their polyamory, but this isn't the majority of people who practice it. Most people would agree that some people do best with polyamory, most do best with monogamy, and many could go either way. Some people feel they are polyamorous as an orientation, like homosexuality, that they have to be in a polyamorous relationship, but I think this is more the minority among people who practice polyamory. There are many people, myself included, who I would say have a polyamorous worldview. I have been in monogamous relationships before, and I could do it again, but even if I became monogamous again, I still wouldn't believe what monogamous people do. That is, that engaging in sexual and emotional exclusivity is the only true way to love someone, or is the ultimate love. Polyamory is like extreme sports. A small percentage of people love it, and they're uniquely suited for it due to their personality and other factors, but most people look at them and go, how the hell does that work? And my god, they're insane. The people most likely to be interested in polyamory and open relationships are people who are high on openness, people who are LGBT, people who have a greater need for emotional intimacy, people who have a greater amount of bandwidth for managing social relationships, and people who don't like traditional scripts for relationships. The people who succeed in polyamory and open relationships are comfortable with shades of gray and relationships that don't fit into neat boxes, possess good negotiation skills, are not conflict averse, or at least willing to work past their conflict aversion, have good self-knowledge, are more independent than not, are able to articulate wants and needs, have a secure attachment style, enjoy building and maintaining relationships, and can deal with the strong emotions of others. Polyamorous and open relationships that succeed are built on a solid foundation of trust and love, model transparency and honesty, and are composed of partners that communicate well. Red flags for trying polyamory and open relationships include more than mild insecurities with no willingness to work past them, codependency, a person with a monogamous worldview dating a person with a polyamorous worldview, and polyamory being expected to fix a previously monogamous relationship, which just makes me go, oh honey, you couldn't handle the emotional needs of one person and you want to add more to that equation? So, I hope I've given you a good idea of what polyamory is and is not, why it frustrates me that Jordan and Brett use the term polyamory when they seem to mean promiscuity or polygyny, and that the kids will probably be okay. If you have any questions, I'm happy to respond to your comments below. I'm sure to make many more videos on polyamory, relationships, dating, sex, and marriage, but only so much content fits in one video. So thank you for watching. If you like this video, give it a like. If you'd like to see more videos, please subscribe, and I hope to have more content for you very soon.